<laughs> Congratulations! <laughs> that's that's what you get when you send. <laughs> So strong. This is it. Come on, dude. So smooth. Yes. Come on. Give it everything. Yes. Come on. Come on. Yes. Let's fucking go, dude. It's been a while since I've made a real training for climbing video. This is going to be a three-part series of how I train my fingers to be strong enough to climb V9 and V10. Part one being how I achieved the benchmark one arm half crimp off of the 20 mil edge, which helped tremendously with getting to V9, making V8 more enjoyable, and making volume sessions on V6s and V5s more fun. Part two is going to be how I got the one arm three finger drag off of the 20 millimeter edge. And part three is going to be how I achieved the one arm half crimp off of the 15 millimeter edge, which gave me enough strength to climb my first V10. So let's get started. The 20 millimeter one handed half crimp. One might think that as long as you progressively overload the fingers with higher weights and smaller edges, you will get there. But it's not that simple. There are so many intricacies, plateaus, and obstacles that came from this journey. Many YouTube videos out there will mention finger strength training in their title, but either venture off into talking about technique or just completely go on a tangent. Bruh. That's why I really wanted to focus on strictly finger strength training in these videos. I realized that this video is long. That's why I made a summary of what I'd recommend at the end that you can screenshot. But the screenshot really would not make any sense unless you watch the video all the way through because I literally go over my entire trial and error progression. And learning from my mistakes, I think, is even more important than learning what I did correctly. When I uploaded this video, I was pretty happy with where I was at. I stuck to the schedule I outlined in that video for almost a year, but I soon realized that there was a limit to where this hangboarding regiment got me to. And I hit a noticeable plateau at two arm max hangs with around 80 to 90 pounds on the 14 millimeter edges. And this would roughly translate to plateauing at limit bouldering moonboard V8s. Seeing footage of pro climbers doing the one arm hang, I wanted to learn it because I knew it would make my climbing fitness better. But the jump from two handed to one handed hangs felt enormous. and my initial efforts were futile. Initially, I tried using a pulley system to learn the one arm hang, but for me, it was not a good approach because setups can change whenever you go from gym to gym. It takes a while to set up and sometimes there's a lot of drag introduced that makes your measurements inaccurate. I talk about it in my campus video, but all of these potential errors from a pulley system led me to lose finger strength compared to when I was just doing two handed max hangs. So I went back to doing that for a while to regain my strength. On that routine, this was one of the first times lifting my feet off the ground on the 20 millimeter edge. It felt very much like a fluke though, on my very best of low gravity days. I was only hanging for a few seconds, I couldn't fight the rotation that is so common when you first start doing this, and I had to really really compensate by flexing my biceps for me to be able to hang on. Both of the latter signs are due to simply weak wrists and fingers. And on my right hand, I couldn't even hang at all. I didn't know how to proceed, so I tried a bunch of random exercises the next month, hoping that one thing would stick and make me stronger. Started doing some random pinches, hangboard pull-ups like Daddy Honold, one-arm assisted pull-ups on the 30 millimeter edge. The result of this random non-specific chaos, no progress at all. So I went back to doing two arm hangs, plateauing around an added 80 pounds, basically continuing to train how I used to, 
But when I went on a Red Rock trip around that time, I felt so weak projecting some V8s that my group hopped on. I only sent a V2 that trip, which lit the strongest fire in me telling me that I can do so much better. Frustrated, I told my friends that I was going to stop climbing cold turkey and just do a pure finger strength training protocol, which I can foreshadow it's not a very good idea to do that because cutting out climbing is cutting out a lot of specificity towards a very movement-centered sport. In 2023, arm lifting got really popular and it just made sense that if I wanted to learn the one arm hang, an approach would be to train the one arm lift towards the goal of lifting my own body weight. I followed the routine spelled out by Yves Gravel, typically starting out with three sets of warm ups, gradually building up the weight intensity, doing eight reps per set. Then for four sets of four, which were the working sets, I'd do 80% of my one rep max. Because my weight was around 150 pounds at the time, it was my end goal to do sets where four reps at 150 were comfortable. This routine at first felt perfect for me. I was in the heat of med school rotations where I basically would work 12 hours a day and have to go home and study. So having less gym time and still being able to train at home was nice. And since each arm lift session would take me about two to two and a half hours to comfortably complete, my training routine changed where I tried fitting in three of these sessions into one week two standalone arm lift sessions at home, and one arm lift session after a moonboard session. This was my first day doing this. For weights, I used two power blocks that I already had at home, and in total, they costed around $500. Alternatively, you can get used plates and a loading pin for probably a lot cheaper, but I've actually found the power blocks useful time and time again because a good portion of my training happens at home, and you actually can use these for so many other applications. I ended up using them for training the planche and the front splits as well. It was useful for me to have these weights at home because some days I would often work late, get to the gym late, and not have enough time to do a arm lift session at the end of my climbing session. Just knowing that I had weights at home allowed me some peace of mind that I can push my climbing session a little longer and have time to do arm lifts at home. Nowadays, I rarely use weights for arm pulls because I bought a 10 deck. With a 10 deck, you can set your desired target weight and basically simulate the sets and reps of a arm lift workout. You can carry it anywhere and it reliably logs the max weight that you pull. But for the beginning or the first couple sessions of arm lift training, I really do encourage just using physical weights. It's like learning the rules so you can break them later and as you go through the process, you'll personally see what you need to buy next. With the strength that I had from hangboarding, I was already pulling 120 pounds on the first day of my working sets. Now, because I had so much more time on my hands not climbing much and just doing arm lifts, after four working sets, I experimented with adding three sets of pinch lifts using a lattice quad block, which in retrospect, I shouldn't have done because that is simply way too much training. Everyone wants to have the crazy pinch strength of a pro climber, but it takes time. The four working half crimp sets, if done right, is actually quite strenuous, and I think adding three additional sets of pinches at the end was more or less junk volume that didn't really lead to much pinch gains when I did this over the course of two months. I made no noticeable gains and was stuck around 70 or 80 pounds for a while. The best training plan is something that is sustainable, and having two huge goals you're jumping for simply is too time consuming. After going through that, I'd recommend just focusing on the half crimp at first, and after you can hang off of that, move on to other grip types that you want to train. It's exciting because when you first start arm lifting, you can expect newbie gains right away. For the second session, the weight I was previously lifting felt so easy, so by the third and fourth set, I added on 10 pounds to lift 130. I did also try 140 that session, but it was too hard. A predicament you'll face is deciding how hard you want to push the weight intensity. Because it always feels like the higher weight you can lift, the faster you'll make gains, but it's not necessarily so. I think rep ranges really matter when it comes to these exercises. There were many times where I would try to push the weight too high for my strength, like for this instance going for one lift of 140 pounds when I can only comfortably do a set of four with 130 pounds. I've learned not to chase a really high weight that you can only lift for about two seconds because the time under tension is just not long enough and it doesn't transfer to a hang. After trial and error, I realized the method that led to the most productive gains is picking a weight you can comfortably do for four, and as soon as you're able to lift a fifth rep, that would be a good indication that you should move up in weight, preferably by five to ten pounds. Thus, it becomes extra important that you find a way to log your progress. The fastest and simplest way i found is just jotting down the numbers in my phone calendar app. After one week of arm lifting, my max hangs did get better, hanging an extra 10 pounds from my usual limit. However, even though I made finger strength gains, what I learned from skipping the gym for a while and only training at home was that you can't really replace climbing with a pure finger strength training routine and expect to get better at climbing. The two really have to be done in conjunction. 
Dr. Tyler Nelson of C4HP talks about this a lot. If you were just to stop climbing and only finger strength train your fingers off the wall, the ability to transfer that to rock climbing would be zero, pretty much. Waste of your time. I think there are grades where if your fingers are strong enough, you can just breeze through problems. But at a certain point, the reason you fall off harder climbs is more due to a lack of body awareness and knowledge and movement patterns, and strength is just secondary. So even though my fingers got stronger training at home, when I went to the gym, I felt it in my soul that my climbing was very rusty, uncoordinated, and just pure garbaggio that day. That's why the previous text that I sent my friends about stopping climbing cold and just doing finger strength training was such a bad idea. Plus, hard climbing trains something that arm lifts don't, which is your contact strength or the speed in which you can generate the force. Even though you're lifting heavy loads with the arm lifts, you'd give your flexors the luxury of having to generate that force over the course of two seconds. But in climbing, you need to generate that force in much less time, like half a second or less. Realizing that my climbing sucked because my technique got rusty and I was not training contact strength from a predominantly home routine, I added two days of moonboarding back to my training. This was also around the time where I found training arm lifts three times a week was taking a toll on my PIP joints. They felt more fatigued and swollen, which subsequently led to weaker pulls. I figured that three times a week was too much and I was not recovering fast enough. To not be self-destructive, I decided to lessen the sessions to two a week. And thus, my new training schedule that I still follow to this day was made. Moonboarding twice a week with finger strength training after those sessions. For this segment of the video, I will be talking about body weight because it's associated with your ability to do the one arm hang. If you've had any issues related to relationship with food or body image, please consider skipping this chapter. Around this time, I thought that if I worked on the one arm hang from a two pronged approach, I would get to my goals faster. I planned on training my arm lifts to be stronger while also cutting off some body weight, which will increase my strength to weight ratio. Yes, there is many avenues to getting better at climbing without losing weight, but what climbing discipline you train matters and what your baseline weight is also matters. And when you feel like you've hit a wall in your climbing, it is a factor that can be experimented with. Relating this to arm pulls, when you're lifting at the limit, the difference say from 140 to 145 seems immense. Even the difference from 140 to 141 can seem immense if 140 is your limit. So I theorized that if I can work on losing body weight, the amount I can arm lift can catch up sooner to my actual body weight, and I'd sooner be able to get the one arm hang. My rationale for losing weight was very personal as well. I was going through a lot of stress during med school. When I released this video in 2022, I weighed around 135 pounds, and at this time I weighed as much as 156. I felt like I was eating a lot as a therapeutic bomb from my stressors from school, eating cafeteria food that was so calorically dense with little nutritional value. I remember stress eating a bunch of Trader Joe burritos like two to three at a time because I was going through so much emotionally. I'd go to the gym and my friends would be like, oh, you gained weight. And I'd just come up with an excuse like, oh, I'm, I'm bulking, I'm bulking, which I think after going through that experience, I would never attempt bulking just because it just made my climbing so much more difficult. Like there were weeks where I would go to the gym and not send anything. And as med school went on, my food addiction got worse where I'd notice I would not eat off of hunger cues, but eat due to wanting to feel happy or to escape from my stress. I guess it didn't really hit me until my friend took a picture of me one day and I was like, mm, my facial features just look so different. And that's when I wanted to make a change. I only bring this up because talking about weight loss and climbing is so taboo. I was hesitant to talk about it with my friends, thinking that I would face backlash. But after going through that experience and being a healthcare practitioner myself who takes care of people with diseases attributable to their weight, I think it is a topic that shouldn't be shied away from. And if your friends do bring it up, you should hear them out. It really opened my eyes to how easily you can gain weight given our current food supply chain that is so saturated with processed, calorically dense foods. And when you couple that with being in a chronically stressed environment, it can be really disastrous. I think realizing this and getting my diet back on track was really a blessing in disguise as well because when I started removing all of the junk food that I was eating, I was also removing all of the inflammatory foods like seed oils, things highly concentrated in omega-6s, etc. This is going to piss a lot of people off, but... Switching to mostly home cooking, just knowing all of the ingredients that you put into your body does help a lot with joint aches and overall recovery. And because I used a calorie tracker to make sure I maintained a tolerable deficit, losing half to one pound per week over the course of many months, I didn't feel like this caloric deficit impacted my training or my climbing that much. That being said, it's important to recognize your end goal too, and I decided that I'd take a hard stop with the dieting once I hit 140, which was close to my original weight from a year prior. The training arc continued on and I was making progress with my arm lifts. 
with metrics slowly but surely going up. And keep in mind, I only started this kind of training a couple weeks ago. Now you can ask different people and they'll tell you different things, but my finger strength training days were the best when I planned them after a bouldering session, where I'm really, really warm after working on projects. If you try to squeeze in a high intensity finger training session within a one hour gym session, you'll likely not be able to pull your actual limit. I've seen people try to fit their arm lift workouts into their lunch breaks, but doing so, you'll just end up not pushing yourself to your fullest potential or just end up getting tweaky fingers. People really underestimate warm up time, but it can take a long time, sometimes an hour to an hour and a half to get properly warm. Comparing my arm lift workouts at home to the ones at the gym, the ones at the gym after a bouldering session hands down always had the better numbers. Along the journey, this is where I made a really big mistake. Within my climbing circles, I've heard about people taking painkillers to project. So for a couple sessions leading up to this day, I have been taking one ibuprofen and one Tylenol before my session, and yeah, I felt strong. Really strong. I was sending some long-term projects, and suddenly I was able to pull 150 pounds for four reps. And then... It was a really bad tear, and I was devastated. Pulleys are load-bearing structures that don't have good feedback in the first place, and the use of painkillers masks the amount of strain you feel even more. I was not able to gauge how tired my fingers felt when I was using them. Pulley injuries are so frustrating. In 2023, I had two. I felt like no matter how carefully I warmed up, I was still prone to them. However, I finally made the connection. I was really prone to pulley injuries back then, despite a good warm up, because I would show up to the gym very dehydrated. I am very bad at drinking water. I literally can go the whole day and forget about drinking water. But the more hydrated you are, the more your pulleys can get hydrated during a warm up, and that will lead to less injury risk. What are you doing? When your shirt gets wet, it doesn't break. So now before climbing sessions, I tend to take an electrolyte supplement with water to get really hydrated. You can drink water alone, but from a physiological standpoint, water is better absorbed with an electrolyte mix due to how water transport is coupled with electrolytes and glucose in your intestinal tract. It's pretty interesting because people who get cholera and end up getting severely dehydrated from diarrhea, this is how they get rehydrated. It's from an electrolyte mix where the water is supplemented with salts and sugar. So I strained some pulley in the left ring finger. It was really hard to accept it at the time, but I learned of a way to still make that hand stronger despite being injured. Whenever you suffer from a pulley injury, it's important to continue training the uninjured side due to what's known as the cross-education effect, which actually has a substantial body of research. The cross-education effect happens when training the uninjured hand alone leads to an increased strength in the immobilized or injured hand. As climbers, we know a lot of strength is neurally driven, and it's theorized that this cross-education effect happens because the body attempts to strive for symmetry. So if you injure one side, an attempt to train the other side will allow for uninterrupted continuation of progress as the ligaments heal. So the training arc continues even further. Even though I was pulling 150 pounds off the 20 millimeter edge on my uninjured hand, which matched my body weight exactly, it was very difficult to apply that to an actual hangboard and hang. It was hard to even hang off the 30 millimeter edge. Thus, I found that my arm lift training from the ground was not specific enough to where the numbers would immediately translate. This part of the journey is actually where things got really interesting as a lot of the time spent away from the gym due to injury allowed me to reflect and I realized three super key concepts to unlocking a stronger half crimp. I went on something that I would call a good form obsession arc. Up until this point, the only thing that mattered to me was pulling the heaviest weight possible with very little focus on form. After getting injured, I took a step back from the intensity and defined some clear rules for myself. Rule number one, form must stay pristine. I promised myself that I would only work with weights where my half crimp form would not open up during the lift. That's the problem when you see people do arm lifts on social media where they post themselves lifting super super heavy weight. For many, their form degenerates horrendously. Like if it's common knowledge to avoid having fingers open up on a hangboard, why are people okay with having fingers open up doing arm lifts? By pulling heavier and heavier weights by any means possible, I was neglecting my form a lot. My hands would often open up and I would be unaware whether my fingers were hyperextended or not. And I think this eccentric overload is why I got injured. I had to keep my ego in check and adjust the weight so my half crimp would strictly stay at 90 degrees. The best way to ensure this is by filming yourself, at least for the first couple of sessions, because sometimes you might feel like you're not breaking form, but in fact you are. When I found myself breaking form, I dropped the weight by 5 or 10 pounds. In terms of form, you want your DIP joints to be neutral or flexed during the crimp, never extended. 
There's also a difference between this half crimp and this half crimp. This is a strict half crimp which generates less force than if you were to extend the wrist. By what's known as tenodesis grasp, extending the wrist actually allows you to passively generate more flexion force, so it's useful to learn this form first and transition to develop the strict form after. Tenodesis grasp is actually a concept physical therapists use to assist stroke patients who lose finger function. Even with flexion deficits, having them extend the wrist allows for almost automatic closure of the fingers and the ability to hold objects again. Applied to climbing, we can take advantage of this wrist extension for a stronger crimp. Rule number two, no index finger chiseling. My goal was to train the index finger to a point where I can actually keep the 90 degree form without chiseling it when the load gets too high. Because you're lifting so much weight with the one arm hang, you need each and every single one of your four fingers to contribute. By chiseling your index finger, you're not allowing it to contribute to the half crimp to its fullest potential. Imagine, it's not to the extreme where you're Tommy Caldwell and you're missing a finger, but having the index finger chiseled all the time is not as optimized as 90 degrees. By having the index at 90, it would help load the forces so much better as well. I feel like a lot of people suffer from capsulitis of their middle and ring fingers because their index finger is chronically undertrained. When your index finger is so weak that it can't help the middle and ring fingers to distribute the high forces of crimping, this can lead to capsulitis. The approach for fixing my index finger was very similar to rule number one, which is only lifting a weight where number one, my form would not open up, and number two, the 90 degree flexion of the index finger would not degenerate to the chisel form. Sometimes you need to regress to progress, and chances are, just by lowering the weight for one or two sessions will allow you to quickly make these adaptations. You'll be surprised how fast your body can adapt. Rule number three, develop and maintain strength in the pinky. Now, one of the most revolutionary things I did during my one-arm hang training was training the pinky in isolation. I once did 20.5 kilos on my pinkies. Yeah, in, in, a, in a crimp position. After watching that short, I kind of had a light bulb moment. When we have crimp, we need all fingers to contribute, and the pinky is across the board the most undertrained finger because chiseling of the pinky is often unavoidable during half crimp training, which is why it's important to train it in isolation. Your one arm hang is only as strong as its weakest link, so I found adding pinky half crimp training in the form of arm lifts to my routine to be highly beneficial and not junk volume. A typical session for me back then was after doing half crimp lifts, I would add three sets of four half crimp pinky lifts. Because that's like seven sets, the way I would streamline it is first do one set of four pinky lifts, immediately go into one set of four half crimp lifts, rest for five minutes, and repeat. A word of caution, because the pinky is such a small digit, definitely go slow for the first couple of sessions trying this out. I'd recommend even warm-up sets of lighter weight that you can pick up for like six or eight reps before the working sets. I'd even do two sets rather than three in the first couple sessions. Something that helped as well is using the other hand to help lower the weight after a lift because in the beginning the part that I felt was most uncomfortable was not the lift up but the moment the weight hits the ground once you lower it due to the vibration of the weight hitting the ground. It's also important to make sure that your cord between your block and the weight is untwisted. If you leave it twisted, the weights can start spinning as you lift up, putting a lot of torque on your pinky. I remember taking a lot of precautions because the pinky felt so fragile when I started this routine. But after about three sessions, the pinky does start to feel a lot more robust and the cues become second nature. So if you struggle with gaining any more strength out of the half crimp, chiseling your index finger chisel and training the pinky are two very low hanging fruit to start training. With each session, these lesser trained fingers will slowly contribute a little bit more to your one arm hang. And it's so satisfying because when you first start training any muscle group for the first time, the newbie gains happen very quick and you'll see quick improvements in the weight you can pull. An end point to strive for with pinky lifts is lifting around 20 to 25 pounds for 4 reps. I made quick gains to this weight and plateaued, but that's what got me the one arm hang on the 20 and 15 millimeter edge, so I was happy with that. The very last thing I added to my routine was 3 sets of using a wrist curl device, which I truly think made a difference. I used this, which is called the arm shark. Basically, I would add some form of wrist curls after my pull sessions because different from pulls where everything is isometric, this is a way to concentrically train your flexor muscles. It also avoids putting load on your pulleys, which give your flexors extra stimulus when your fingers are already fatigued. Simply put, it's a finisher workout after four sets of half crimp lifts and three sets of pinky lifts. Training the flexors with this device, it's also so convenient to just flip the device around and train your antagonistic muscles as well. For the flexors, I would pick a weight heavy enough that I can only do five or six reps and do three sets of that. 
And in between those, I would do three sets of 12 antagonistic extensions. If I was at the gym, I'd connect it to a cable machine. It's kind of dumb of me, but I used to work like crazy to pull back the weight before doing the curls because I didn't know to readjust the machine. It took me about five sessions to realize that I can just set it up like this and just make everything so much easier. If I had to do curls at home, I found that using a table is a good approach. Because the table really isolates the movement, a useful pointer is not to expect to pull as much weight as you do on a cable machine when you're at home. Go around 10 pounds less. One thing I did wrong back then was I was doing such full wrist range of motions with the curls, going all the way into extension and into flexion. Why this is not ideal sometimes is because I was pushing heavy weight and at times my wrist would click with every rep. So I think it's better for your joints if you just go from neutral to flexion rather than full extension to flexion. And I mean this for antagonist extension curls as well. Don't go from full flexion to full extension, just go from neutral to full extension. This is also a good modality for training when you have a pulley injury or a finger tweak because doing wrist curls allows you to maximally train the flexor muscle with minimal load to the pulleys, which is why I think any serious boulderer should own some kind of a wrist curling device. This one was quite costly and after trying a couple other ones, I'd actually recommend buying this device. It's very similar to the Iron Mine Rolling Thunder that is common in grip strength competitions, but since it's not an official instrument used for competition, it costs way less. Nowadays, I actually prefer to use this rotating bar to do isometric arm lifts because it's a way to ensure I don't crack my wrists with these exercises. I found that since all joints in your hand are related, instability from cracking even at the wrist can cause some aches in your finger joints. But whether isometric or concentric, I definitely recommend trying this form of training out because you can make some serious gains with these devices. Alright, that was a lot of talking. Let's do a recap. After my climbing sessions that happen twice a week, I would do 4 sets of arm lifts and 3 sets of pinky lifts. Sometimes I would throw in 1 or 2 hang attempts on the Beastmaker 20mm edge to see how much progress I've made. If I decided to do hangs, it would be the first thing I'd try after climbing because if you do it after arm lifts, you're generally really tired. Afterwards, I would do wrist curls, tailoring the weights to where I can do 5-6 to six reps on flexion and 12 reps on extension, and I would do 3 sets for both. None of these exercises are set in stone, like if you're really tired one day, just skip sets, like just do 2 out of the 3 or like just don't do wrist curls at all. Just don't burn out and quit. And that's pretty much it. That was the formula that I stuck to twice a week that eventually got me my one arm hang. Many times, a predictor of how strong of a day I would have is whether I had good sleep or not. On a day with very little sleep, you can expect your strength to be significantly less than your last session. It's just important to stay consistent with it all and you'll see your metrics fluctuate but overall uptrend over time. At some point, I reintroduced arm lifts to my left hand too and afterwards it caught up surprisingly quickly, first doing hangs on the 30mm edge and then the 20mm edge. I actually was surprised of how fast it recovered and I did write in my training journal that I found wrist curls to be very helpful for strength building, especially when I couldn't do any finger related stuff that would aggravate it. As your body adapts after doing arm pulls for quite some time, the wrist curls as a finisher exercise really gives a next level of forearm soreness to your workout. I think I can be pretty extreme with training, but even this schedule looks really packed for me. So I'll discuss endpoints to when you can start considering offloading some of these exercises just so you don't have a bajillion things to do. Reflecting back, after achieving the one arm half crimp for about 5 seconds, I think that should have been an endpoint to when I'd consider stopping arm lifts or just taking a break from doing them for a little bit. It's rarely discussed, but if you keep doing arm lifts consistently twice a week, you can actually develop a callus over your middle finger that's very prone to splitting. And when you have a split, the pain serves as a neurological feedback for your body to severely limit how hard you can pull. I found that to be the worst issue with arm pulls because the callus pretty much will not go away if you continue arm lifting consistently. And if you really think about it, if you do arm lifts, say 4 sets of 4 reps, that's 16 repetitions of microtrauma that keeps adding callus to that one spot. Compare that to doing 3 sets of 7 second max hangs, that would just be 3 repetitions of microtrauma that is very less callus developing. I guess back then, I was just so scared of losing my gains that I kept doing arm lifts. I would try to prevent the split by really taping that split prone area. I tried alternating edges from the 20mm edge to the 10mm edge with a roughly converted weight. But when you do a lot of lifts on the 10mm edge, you'll run into the same issue, developing another split just a little higher up. Trust me, you likely will not lose the one arm hang if you stop doing arm lifts because after you learn it, you realize how much of it is both a combination of strength and technique, like the technique from the rules I was talking about earlier. 
So really, after getting the one-arm hang for 5 seconds, see if you can maintain that by just doing 3 sets of hangs for around 5 seconds after a climbing workout without doing any more arm lifts. That would make your life so much simpler. After I was able to hang for 5 seconds, I also tapered off the wrist curls and eventually took them out of the routine. They were just meant for extra strength building, but once you get that one-arm hang strength, you don't need wrist curls to maintain it. The only time I would reintroduce these exercises is if I suffer from a pulley injury or if I want to build even more flexor strength, say if I wanted to progress from 20 millimeters to 15 millimeters. So that just leaves us with pinky lifts. I actually still do them for every single session just to maintain strength. I particularly find them useful as three sets of warm-ups in between warm-up hangs just to really awaken my half crimp for a good climbing session. The pinky actually contributes an absurd amount of strength to your half crimp and I found that just doing half crimp pulls doesn't really warm them up as well as if I were to do them in ISO. One last thing that I'll emphasize, after getting the one arm hang, one way to make it more difficult is to eventually try to lessen how flexed your bicep is and try to hang off of a straighter arm. Just because there will always be climbs where you'll need to catch something really reachy with a straight arm. It's pretty difficult to do at first, but the more you can straighten your arm, the more you're training your intrinsic forearm strength and relying less on compensation from your biceps and your shoulders, which I think makes a big difference on the wall. You can also start adding weight, and one thing I found to be super helpful is using a stool next to your feet so you can maintain stability and not spin. This doesn't really lessen the intensity of your exercise at all, and it helps you optimize the stimulus to your fingers. But yeah, that's pretty much my journey on the 20mm one arm half crimp. I don't want to drag this video on any longer. I will leave some summary slides for screenshotting as promised. Drop your questions and comments down below and I'll see you in the next video which will likely be on the 20mm one arm three finger drag.